Well, thanks for joining me today. We've got a fabulous guest on this episode of the Patterson Podcast. Her name's Erica, and she's got a fabulous story to tell us about her dramatic improvement following a low-fat plant-based diet. And welcome to the call, Erica. Hi. So where I'm are you? I'm so like, happy to just be talking to you. Uh, you're like an inspiration because I, you know, you're the first person I watched to like overcome an autoimmune disease with a plant-based diet. So thank you for going through all that. So I could be in this <laughs> position. Well, that's one of the reasons that I was so motivated to get to the end result because, um, you know, about three quarters of the way through the process, Melissa, my wife said to me, she said, you know that we should be putting all this together, everything that we've learned, all of these things that you're doing, because they're so unusual compared to, you know, the way that anyone else around us was eating and also anything that we'd been able to salvage online with, uh, you know, any kind of information online. So she said, if we only help one person by putting all this together in a way that's available online, then it will have been worth it. And so you know, yeah, it's it's certainly gone a lot more than that, but it, it's just lovely to speak to people who've uh, who've who've benefited as a result of, you know, what is very difficult times. So why don't you talk about the difficult times that you went through, and then how you came to uh, to make some exciting improvements, which you know I haven't heard about. This is all new to me, so I'm excited to hear this as we go. Okay, so I just want to first off talk about, um, I got in a really bad car accident back in 2000. I was 15 years old. I'm 29 now. Uh, I had a, I broke about eight of my vertebrae in my, my spine. Gosh. gosh. Uh, I did have spinal fusion done. So I feel like after that, um, I noticed like just a lot of changes like over the years, like I was getting more fatigue, I had more brain fog, I had confusion, dizziness, body aches, and this is like went on for a very long time until I saw the physical symptoms of my RA. So, I don't know if like being in cuz I was in it took it was a long recovery. I was on morphine, you know, probably antibiotics, all mm. these different things that I'm now connecting back. Um because when you think about trauma and, you know, antibiotics and, you know, I've researched and all that and I've listened to you talk about that. I feel like that was like the start of like my leaky gut. And um, so it kind of just progressed from there. Um, so basically uh, in November 2014 or 2015. Okay. Um, I had started experiencing, uh, like swelling and stiffness in my fingers. And at the time I was a rock climber with my boyfriend. We would rock climb all the time. I had been climbing for a few years. So I thought that I may have like injured my fingers. And mm. so I just kind of like, you know, put on the back burner. I'm like, Oh, I'll probably go down. Like I probably pulled something in my finger. And then it wasn't going down, and uh, I was experiencing, you know, severe fatigue. I actually passed out at work, so dizzy. I passed out. I didn't know why. I hadn't been to the doctors in a very long time. Um, so I wasn't up to date with, like, you know, my vitamin B, vitamin D, like, uh, you know, my iron. I hadn't checked any of that for a long time. So, um Basically, I had asked some of the climbers, like, hey, have you experienced this? I showed them my fingers, and they're like, whoa, because they were really swollen. And they're like, no, I have, like, never seen that before. And they're like, you should probably go get that checked out. So I was like, okay. And it was really weird because um, my grandma had rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, she – the d disease was really progressive with her and she had osteoporosis. She was only like 55. And so um, basically within like five years, she got extremely sick and I had like multiple surgeries. Okay. And so um, she passed away because of complications from medication. And that was like back in uh, 2000, actually right before my car accident. So I don't think they had a lot of research behind the medication um, she was just extremely sick and fatigued anyways. So anyways, I had that in the back of my mind 
because I'm like, for all these years, I thought something was medically wrong with me, but I didn't go to the doctors because I was scared. You know, I was like, okay, like, I feel like something's severely wrong with me because like, I had all these, I had congestion all the time, major congestion, uh, depression, anxiety, severe stress, just a combination of all these terrible things. And so, and it didn't matter like how good things were in my life. I couldn't get rid of my depression and anxiety. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Like, and you know, I would just be driving and I'd get super lightheaded and then it would give me anxiety. So I'm like, am I getting lightheaded? And then I'm getting anxiety or do I have anxiety? And then I'm getting lightheaded. So basically, um, I decided to go to the doctors in January, 2016. And, uh, I went to my primary care uh, physician and uh, I told him like, hey, I have some swelling like this is, you know, I'm not feeling good. He checked out my knuckles and he was like, well, you're a climber like, you know, and I told him like I thought maybe it would be rheumatoid arthritis. And he was like, no, you're really young. Like, why would you think that? I'm like, well, my, I know my grandma had it and I honestly haven't been feeling well for a very long time. And at that point, I had been looking online to, like, see about symptoms. And, like, a lot of the symptoms I was, like, experiencing, mine, you know, the physical ones were, you know, what people with RA have. And so uh, he went and checked my RF factor. And then he checked, uh, like, my iron, my vitamin D, my B12. So a few days later, he calls me back and he says, okay, there's a couple things. You're extremely anemic, like extremely anemic. Uh, you're extremely like B12 deficient and you're vitamin D deficient. And he's like, and another thing is your RF factor is elevated. It was 37. Okay. Okay. So he says, he's like, I, he's like, you could, he's like, some people have elevated RF doesn't mean you have arthritis. He's like, so I'm going to send you to a specialist. So I'm like, okay, like really scared, you know, I'm like, like I already had one positive number. And so, um, I think I, I got into the rheumatologist in March, beginning of March and, uh, she checked, you know, checked my joints, checked, you know, asked how I was feeling. And then she goes, well, I'm going to go ahead and run, uh, your CCP and your CRP and your ESR. Good. So. Uh, she ran those numbers and, uh, the next visit I had come back to her, she, she had me come in and she went over it with me and she said, your CCP is 144.3. So she said, that's really high. Cause I think normal is like less than four or something like that, less than 10 or less than four. So, and at that point, you know, I didn't know anything about any of these numbers, you know, mm. it wasn't even like significant in my mind. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, I don't understand, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and my ESR was eight and then my CRP was 0. 0.2, 0. 0.30. So it was still under one, it was still low, but I could feel that it was going to get worse. It was getting worse because I was feeling it in my feet. I was feeling it in my shoulders. And I'm like, okay, something's like really going down. So that conversation with her was basically like 10 minutes. (laughs) Okay. She didn't ask me about anything in my life. She just says, this is your numbers. You have rheumatoid arthritis. You're going to have this for the rest of your life. And you have the progressive form of the disease. Well, it's all progressive. So I don't know why she said that your form is progressive. She said according to, because I, I'm seropositive. Oh, right. Okay. Because yeah. of that. And my CCP was really high. And I guess they go off of the CCP and it could predict how progressive your oh, disease okay. is. Yep. All right. yeah. mm-hmm. So she tells me that and she goes, she gives me, I even have it right here. This is the methotrexate. 
All oh, right, information yeah. sheet. In my search hack sheet, mm-hmm. um, and she's like, "Oh, you know, it does have some side effects. Uh, you will lose your hair. Don't worry about, you know, having a baby. Don't even try to do that. Um, you know, just all this terrible stuff." So yeah. I'm like, I left, and I'm like, "Wow!" Like I felt like my old self died. I was like, like I felt like I got diagnosed with cancer because I'm like holy crap, like, this could get terribly out of control. Like, you don't know, you don't have any control at that point. So you're just like, like, what am I going to do? You know, I like, I was with my boyfriend's mom. She went with me. And I just felt so, you know, lost. She had uh, prescribed the methotrexate and sulvisalazine. And so um, she's like, you know, you need to get on immediately. We need to treat this aggressively. You know, your joints are going to get damaged. And before that, she had me do an x-ray, and the x-ray didn't show any damage at that point, so that was good. Um, So anyways, I go to pick up the sofa saladine because I'm like, okay, this is my only option, you know, like, what am I going to do? Like, I hadn't started digging into, like, the holistic, you know, trying to treat this naturally because I'm like, okay, wait a second. I've heard about all people with RA. I know they're all on medications. Like, why do I think that I could achieve this through okay, some yep. other way, right? Mm-hmm. So I go to the pharmacy and uh, they tell me that the sofasalazine is, uh, they didn't have any. That they, I needed, they ran out and I needed to come back the next day. Okay, so within that one day, like my boyfriend, my boyfriend's mom, me, we're just online searching for everything, Mm -hmm. you know, there has to be another way. And the reason I say that is because I treated myself very poorly my whole life. I had extremely high anxiety, you know, extremely high, like, um, and then I just had the worst eating habits. I basically ate bread and cheese, the worst things, you know, for me, like my whole life, just bread and cheese, bread and cheese, bread and cheese, wow. bread and cheese. Okay. Yep. Fast food, any type, like <laughs> French, fries, French fries from everywhere. Sometimes in and out, like three, four times a week. I'm not even joking. Okay. And yeah. I was like, oh, I do this because like I'm thin you know like I don't have to worry about this but it's like it's not what's on the outside it's what's on the inside and that's what I'm like totally have learned through this you know whole process so anyways I uh went online and uh my boyfriend actually found your TED talk and we love TED talks like I've been watching them for like forever I mean on any random thing I'm like so interested in it So he finds your TED talk and uh, so I'm like, wow, there's like someone that overcame this and like you were in a terrible position, you know, I'm like, okay, if someone in that condition can do something like this with discipline and determination, like maybe I can. So um, I actually, I found uh, a naturopathic doctor too as well. And so I saw a naturopathic doctor and the thing that I've learned now is that naturopathic doctors get fed information that's like, you know, from like produced from like meat companies and stuff. Like I just know like the train of how like information gets to the schools. And so it's like paleo diet, you know, right? So I got sold on the whole paleo thing. You know, you got to eat a lot of meat. You got to have a lot of fats, like tallow, all this stuff, right? You know, but it's like, it's good in a sense where you only, where you get to cut out the junk, you get to cut out the dairy, you get it to cut out the, you know, I cut out the grains and the bread and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I did that. Did you do the, like, did you do what some people call the autoimmune protocol, which is a sort of autoimmune version of, or did you just yeah. do, yeah, you did that. Okay. So. I did that. I did that for like two months. Yep. Okay. I did that for two months. And uh, honestly, I didn't really tell if like anything was bothering me because thinking back now, it was just the meat. 
it wasn't the white potatoes or whatever because paleo is so like no white potatoes no this you know and it's like no tomatoes and what i've read like people with like these uh allergies to those nightshades uh is like extremely rare and i think but i i i do believe that some people have these allergies but i don't think for me that was the case it's Okay. Then me and tell you how I got there. Yeah, we, but, um, I, I can comment on that later as well. So I'm excited to hear where where the, you know the rest of your uh, personal journey, and at the end we can talk about some of these uh, details. Okay, yeah. So what happened next? Okay, so um, okay, so I realized during the last year we went to Yosemite. Cool. And we went to Yosemite last August. And because uh, we're climbers, we love nature, we go to Joshua Tree, you know, we used to climb, but this last year I didn't climb, you know, because of my hands. Mm -hmm. um, but I did hike because I had so much energy because I'd been juicing, you know, for, you know, I had been juicing for 10 months. You know, I, I did eat a lot of veggies minus the meat, but I did eat a lot of veggies and didn't eat junk food, didn't drink soda. I mean, I haven't had a soda in like a year and something. Um, so I was feeling better. So I, I did the hike. Um, I totally lost what I was saying. Okay. So at this point, uh, are you still on the, uh, sort of paleo meat plus vegetables approach? Oh, no. No. Oh, 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 this is what I was saying too. Cool. Is that when we went to Yosemite, we had a uh, prepackaged food. And so we made roast beef. Okay. Or pot roast. We made a bunch of pot roast. And I like even be like over the year or the year of being paleo, I didn't really like eating a lot of meat. I was a vegetarian like a long time ago. And like, I just, you know, I always loved animals and I'm like, I always felt guilty for eating animal protein, mm. you know, but it's like so a part of our society that you just give in. Mm. So anyways, I'm like, okay, I need to eat paleo. I need to eat healthy during this trip. So I made a bunch of pot roast. Okay. Okay. And so I hadn't had that much red meat because we were there for uh, six days camping. Yep. So I hadn't had that much red meat. And by the end of the trip, I thought it was like elevation, this, you know, I was trying to blame it on different things. But really thinking back, my fingers got even more swollen because I was eating so much red meat. And I, at the time I was like, oh, it was probably the potatoes and the pot roast. <laughs> no. So, uh, yeah, so, um, this last December, um, I just had this feeling that red meat at the time, I just thought it was red meat in December. I was like, okay, I think red meat is really irritating me. Like I've been doing so good with this paleo diet. It's supposed to be, you know, the cure all. And I still have inflammation. Yeah. Like my pain had subsided. My pain had subsided, like, basically, like, 96, 97%. My pain did. Okay, and so did my stiffness. But my inflammation just was, like, so stubborn. And I'm like, okay, it has to be meat. And then I, like, revisited your, um, well, I didn't tell you this, but probably, like, in June. Okay, so I started the paleo diet last March when I was diagnosed. And then in June, uh, my boyfriend bought me your program because I was having so much inflammation and so much pain. And uh, I wasn't ready to commit to your program because I was like, oh, this sounds so extreme. You know, like I still and I was like, in my mind, I'm like, oh, I still need to do the paleo diet. Yeah, okay. sure. You hadn't completely no. decided whether or not it was going to do the job or not. Exactly. So I was like, yeah. well, let me at least try this out yeah. for a year and then do that. Right. That's right. Yep. So, in so in December, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to cut the red meat out and see what happens. So I cut the red meat out this last December. And so, um, and then all December, I was barely eating any chicken or any fish. I was trying to do mostly like vegan dishes. Yeah. Because all along, since the beginning, since the beginning of seeing your video and then just reading about plant based diets, watching documentary like Forks Over Knives, Food Matters, Fat Sick, and Nearly uh, Dead. Nearly Dead, all those things. I was like, okay, plant based diet has to be the way. It just <laughs> has to be. Like, 
It, how can it not be? <laughs> like, you know, like animal protein is terrible. Now that I like think back on it, I'm like, holy crap. Like I've only been officially vegan like for like a month and a half. Okay. So um, I'm talking like, you know, hardcore, like all the way. Um, so anyways, so yeah, I cut out the red meat, cut out the fish and whatever. And then um, officially at the beginning of January when I was like, okay, no animal products like ever. And I even within a week of me cutting it out, my inflammation went down. So I had started the vegan diet like a few weeks before I just last saw my rheumatologist where I just last got my blood results that I'll tell you about. Mm -hmm. So I cut it out and I'm like, oh, like I even felt a gazillion times better. I felt like I didn't have this like stagnant energy like in my body. Like I just felt so much clearer. And, and it's funny because I think – my mom. So my mom got me um, a Bikram yoga pass. I asked awesome. it for her for Christmas. So awesome. she got yeah. that me this last December. Yeah. And it's funny because I knew you emphasize that so much. So I feel like the Bikram yoga and the plant based diet just came together at the right time. And yeah. I think I feel like everything just came together in the right time for just how it needed to play out, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it happened when I was ready to do it and when I knew it needed to happen because I simply wasn't seeing the results that I thought I should have been seeing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. So this last visit with, um, do you have any questions or do you want me to go into my last visit with um, my rheumatologist? When did you visit your rheumatologist last? So, um, where, uh, you know, how long ago were these last tests? Okay, so What's the um, date? my last, let's see. Or just like, is it mid-January, end of January? Um, let, me, let me get it right here. Okay, and whilst yeah, you're doing that, first. just in case someone's watching this a long time or listening to this a long time after we've recorded this, we're recording this uh, on the 23rd of February, 2017. So um, that's where we're at now, 23rd of Feb. Or you're a day behind yeah. because you're in the States, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So I went on February 9th. Okay. So a little over two, no, it's two weeks ago. A little under. Yeah, two weeks yes. ago. Okay. Yeah. So it's all, it's all Yeah, recent. very, it's right so, now. So here's the thing. When they check your CCP, okay, they only check it once. And if you're positive, you're positive. Okay. So my rheumatologist, oh, I forgot to tell you, um, when I first got diagnosed by the first rheumatologist, I asked to see a second rheumatologist to get a second opinion mm -hmm. and someone who was a lot nicer because I feel like my first rheumatologist was like, you have this, that's it. You sure. know, I was crying. She wasn't even concerned about it. So I asked to see another second, yep. another rheumatologist. Good. And so I told this rheumatologist that I didn't want to get on medication that, um, I wanted to try to do this by myself. So this rheumatologist, the second rheumatologist knew that I was trying to do this with diet, even though she thought it had nothing to do with it. Yeah. She was like, you know, they're, they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like that has absolutely nothing to do with it. She's like, I heard some people, you know, can take turmeric and it helps. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So anyways, she knew about that. Yeah. And so um, I told her that I wanted to check my CCP again when I gave myself one year of healing my leaky gut, which yeah, she good. doesn't get either. Okay? Which she didn't, so, had never heard of, right? She'd never heard of that. No, no, no she never, no. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and then, um, so I asked her to recheck my CCP, my ESR, my CRP, and my RF. Yeah, good. Before, before I went in to see her this last time. Yeah. Okay. So it's crazy. It was way more than I ever expected. Like, okay. So my RF went from 37 down to negative and to below 10. Wow. Yep. Okay. My CRP uh, was uh, 0 0.30 to point less than 0 0.20. Which means that they cannot detect it. 
below that measurement. Less than yeah. point less than point two means we don't know how low it is. It's just below the level of measurement of our equipment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then my I'm saving the best one for last. And then my ESR, um, my ESR stayed the same. It was still eight. So I don't know. I was reading that like some people's blood is just that's the way it is. I don't know. So well, I'm not sure. ESR will ESR will pick up everything. If you're just got a little bit of a sniffle, or you've got a little bit of uh, muscular pain, or you've got a, a a little bit of a cold, or if you've just got a backache, it'll pick up all sorts of inflammation. Um, okay. But let's be realistic here. Um, the average person on the street without any kind of diagnosis, if they had their ESR measured, my guess is it's probably going to be somewhere between four and eight anyway, okay. because normal is under 20. So like it's less than the 50% marker within normal. So yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, okay. So then my CCP, which she was, she was really reluctant to retest this. She was annoyed. Okay. Because, you know, she hadn't seen me. I actually emailed her before I got had my appointment with her and emailed her. And she said, okay. So I got my CCP back. And it was from 144.3 down to less than 27. Wow. Just incredible. Okay. Yeah. So I go to the doctor's appointment. Yeah. And I'm like, at that point, because she hadn't released um, my CCP to me, like, because uh. I get my lab results through online. And the first time she ran my CCP, she never released it to me. I had to go down and get it from my medical records. I don't know why they do that. And then the second time, she didn't release it to me. So I didn't know my CCP until I saw her in the doctor's office. So I had no clue what was going on. I knew that my, I was like, freaking jumping for joy when I knew my RF factor went into the negative. Okay. So I get there and she's like, you know, how are you doing? Like, you know, and I'm like, good, like really good. And she's like, "Mm, tell me about this because I looked, I just look better like from Bikram and just from eating this way. And, you know, when I first went in there, you know, I'm all hunched over and like I, my hair was thin, my hair was dry, my skin was dull, all, you know, all that stuff. And now it's like my skin is so bright, mm. like my hair is finally growing. It has never grown. Like, you know, I, that's why I knew it was unhealthy. I'm like, nothing would ever grow. Like I knew something wasn't right. And so I went in there, you know, and she could tell that I just looked yeah. better, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so she was just like. Uh, I think she was just prepared, like, you know, she kind of knew what was going on. So I go, can you, like, before we even go into detail about anything, I'm like, can you just, I'm like, I'm just so curious. Can you please give me my CCP? Yeah. And she goes, yeah. She's like, okay, let me take a look at it. And I don't know if she had even looked at it before she even went into the room because they're so busy. I don't know if they do that. Possibly, yeah. She shocked with me that it went down like that. Yeah. And then, so I just went into, you know, she's like, tell me what you've been doing. You know, I said, I changed my um, diet to vegan. I juice every single morning. The first thing I do before I put one ounce of food into my system, I basically drink all water. I exercise every single day. I meditate. I like, you know, got connected to God. I've become connected to my food. You know, it's crazy what, how it will change you. Like, I'm like so like an environmental like activist right now because I'm like, it's crazy when you learn about, you know, agriculture and like meat production and what it does to our environment. It's absolutely like, how could people want to contribute to any of that? You know, so it wasn't even about just my RA. It was like mm. everything. You know, yes. like, like saving the wildlife, saving our rainforest. Like I got, I'm, I'm crazy with all this stuff now, but anyways, yeah. 
Now you're giving so me I, you're giving me goosebumps I, right now because I had the same I, I, I had the exact same sort of uh, evolution of realization. So first I realized that it was about pain and that it was about me and it was about serving my own needs and the best way to do it was to as, eat as much nature as possible, as much plant foods as possible. And uh, and and then what transpired after that is once I felt better, I thought, but it but it's more than just me. I just came to this via my own personal sort of needs but now i realize that you know you feel quite superior as a human being in that you don't harm other living animals and that feels really good and I think that yeah more out of anything i feel so good that i'm like i feel like i'm like yeah like i'm not contributing to like all this t- terrible stuff that's going in the world like not to like make you like, you know, have this big ego, but it's kind of like, wow, like I have this responsibility. And I didn't tell you when I uh, first changed my diet to paleo, when I got diagnosed, I had made an Instagram account to document my journey. Okay. So people have been, and it's all been food related. Okay. And then occasionally I post progress pictures of my hands and blood work oh, and stuff like that. Oh, and by the way, when I just got my blood work done too, I had her recheck like my vitamin D and my ferritin and all that. All my blood work is completely normal. Outstanding. Okay. Okay. And some people, so I have this Instagram account and people message me, you know, to, you know, to get help. They're like, I'm sick. I'm this, you know? So people have been following me with the paleo diet, you know, and then I changed my diet to vegan. So it's like a whole other world, right? Because all paleo people are like, no grains. Like they can't even look at bread or, you know, they're so anti it's a, that. It's a nightmare of a diet. It's a nightmare yes. of a diet. Well, so, now that I'm, I had to unfollow all the paleo people because I'm like, I can't see all this meat. Like it's grossing me out. I'm like, that was me. Like, so now I have this obligation, you know, I told everyone I changed my diet to vegan that basically if you're trying to heal yourself from an autoimmune disease, it cannot contain one ounce of animal protein, like no cheats, no nothing. Like it's, it's gotta be plant-based. Like there's no other way I'm convinced, you know? And so, um, so yeah, now I have this obligation to get the word out there because one, it's, you know, for their health Two, it's for the environment. And three, it's like, you know, you're saving animals from being tortured and killed for what? Two minutes of satisfaction. Like it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Exactly. So, um, that, and, and of course that's the, the third part of the, the trifecta is the, is the planet because it's hugely understated about how much the production of animals contributes to environmental yeah. disaster. Because just because, in a nutshell, um, animals or livestock require so much land in which mm-hmm. to graze and to basically uh, develop into full beasts. Um, oh, and yeah. then those beasts can only supply a small amount of energy uh, to human beings. But the same amount of land... Uh, can be used to create crops which can feed a dramatically higher number of people and also there's no pollution with regards to runoff with regards to the you know feces and into rivers and of course all of the methane problems and yeah i mean yeah. this is just you know just for listeners who are just the tip of the iceberg documentary, cowspiracy i haven't watched cowspiracy you know i don't I think everyone should watch, and at one point I will watch it. But uh, you know, my my cup is full with my desire to continue doing what I'm doing. I don't need any more. Yes, you know, I mean? imagine yeah. because I already feel myself, you know, taking on this role. I'm like, oh my god, I feel obs- I'm just obsessed with learning, basically, like through my whole journey. And this is what I tell my followers: like, you have to be your own researcher. You have. Like, no one's going to take care of your health except you. Like, ultimately, at the end of the day, you're the one making the decisions of what you're putting in your body. Like, that's just, like, basically it, you know? So it's, like, that's what I said. Like, I, you know, I tell people about, like, documentaries I found. And this, this actually really um, inspired me to go vegan as well because I had been reading this before I actually made the commitment but this is the world peace diet and it's about a plant-based diet. And it basically goes into everything about like the production of me and how 
it affects our health and all these different things. So this book, like really, and I wanted to share that because it's a really good book. And if people are on the fence about like, you yeah. know, going plant-based, that's totally something I recommend. Um, large portion of our um, audience are actually just audio. So you might just want to read out the name of that book and author. Oh, okay. So um, it's the World Peace Diet. And it's Eating for Spiritual Health and Social Harmony. And it's by Will Tuttle, um, PhD. Fantastic. Okay, so people can pick that up on Amazon, I imagine. So um, you've done an absolutely outstanding job. It's re what's really cool is we get so many clients, I want to say, or, or, or people who I'm working with who go through the process that you went through, which is going through that AIP or, uh, you know, autoimmune protocol. And then it normally does last about a year and then they come across. And oh. the re yeah, and the reason is, and it actually makes sense because I see the autoimmune protocol or something that still contains meat and some high fat foods like coconut oil, which is included in there. It, it's, it's a natural uh, progression towards the ultimate way to eat. So what Patterson program does is just take you there in an instant. But what yes. autoimmune protocol does is take you halfway and then you make improvements because you've eliminated the, the junk food mm -hmm. and you've eliminated the yeah. dairy products. But yeah. you're still left with some high fat um, oil based foods uh, like the coconut oil and you still got meat. So you've gone halfway and yeah. you've got another halfway to go. Yeah. I mean, honestly, if I could tell anyone, like, I would start the program, like, immediately, you know, and, but it took me, you know, to this point to where I finally decided and it happened all in the right timing. And like I said, I did learn from the paleo diet to, you know, cut out all the junk food and the fast food and yeah. all that stuff. It's just, um, yeah, meat is just, you know, meat and dairy, like dairy is my number one trigger. Like probably um, la last June, actually, when I was like super swollen and my boyfriend purchased the program for me, um, I accidentally had like, um, I went to Panera Bread and I wasn't even thinking that they put like heavy creamer in the tomato soup. Oh, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Tomato I soup, yeah. So like, because I hadn't had tomato soup for so long, you know, and so um my finger got so swollen, but it's crazy because I know I can manage that because the next few days I'm like, okay, exactly. I'm just going to eat salads. I'm going to be, you know, not eating the best things, but you know, now I love salads before I was like, Oh, it was a chore. Now I like eat every day for lunch. I have a huge bowl of spinach and arugula and cut up cucumbers and tomatoes and garlic and uh, avocado and hemp seeds and sweet potato. That's my lunch. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, and um, how far have you got back uh, into reintroducing food? So perhaps you could list where you're at with, as much, with the sort of foods that you're eating each day to give someone an idea if they're thinking, oh, gee, it does sound all too hard and I really want to hang on to my meat. But what sort of foods are you able to enjoy at the moment, keeping in mind, listeners, that it gets big, more and more and more broad as you go? Okay, so um, for breakfast, um, I have my juice in the morning. That's the first thing I have. And that's and celery and cucumber, isn't it? Celery, cucumber, kale, Swiss chard, lemon, green apple, and ginger root. Awesome. That's, Fantastic. That's every single morning, a mason jar. I got. Yep, you've got it right there, oh, that size and jar. It, yep. Yeah, that size jar. And then um, I make a um, vegan uh, banana bread with like buckwheat flour, oat flour, uh, flax meal, um, and it's got like pecans in it, and it's all banana. And uh, so yeah, that's my breakfast, and I'll spread some like uh, like almond butter on it. Wow! So like, you're you're in what I would describe as our phase five maintenance phase. So you are yeah. eating many foods that I call advanced foods that includes yes. the nuts, yeah. the nuts butter. So you, yeah. you've you done outstandingly well to be able to, um, you know, handle those foods at this point. And that's really exciting. Well, what I want to share, and this is what I talked to my doctor about, is that 
I never, I dodged the bullet when it came to medication. Like the, the interesting thing about my story is that people already were sick on the medication and that was their last resort. Whereas I suffered, I'm going to say suffered for like seven months with very, very, very swollen, tender fingers and achy and stiff. But I was so scared of the medication that I just kept believing in the food. I was like, no, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing this. So I had to power through that without any medication. Mm. I actually had one um, steroid shot when I first got diagnosed because, you know, they're like, well, you can't leave here without taking medication. Let me take a steroid <laughs> shot. You know, yeah, because yeah. they're, they're so swollen. She's like, you got to do something. So the nurse convinced me to take a steroid shot. And it did help. But then it and it, when it wore off in a month, immediate, I felt like it got even worse after the steroid shot. So I didn't want that again. Um, so, yeah, you just, yeah, that that's basically. So uh, anyway, so that's for breakfast. And then for lunch, like I said, I'll have spinach, arugula, cucumbers, um, tomato, garlic. And then I put some avocado and some hemp seeds on it. Mm-hmm. And then I have a baked uh, sweet potato with it. Yum. That's a delicious lunch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's amazing. I can eat it like every single day. Yeah. And what's for dinner? And then for dinner, it's been a comp. It's been pretty much the same kind of things, just a different arrangement, but I'll have um, black beans. So I make my own black beans, like a batch in the beginning of the week. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. And I miss it so much because being paleo, they're like, no beans, yeah. no rice. And I'm like, yeah. I'm Mexican and I grew up like eating Mexican food. Like they're like, that was torture for me. Okay. So now I'm like, yes, like I could eat this like every week. So I'll, I'll make brown rice or wild rice or quinoa and black beans, uh, pinto beans, Whatever, you know, just make, and then I make yeah. like Buddha bowls. So I'll have like my rice and then some sort of potato and then the black beans and then um, nuts. I always put nuts yep. for like extra protein and then some fresh sprouts. So I like to add like raw stuff incorporated with it. Okay. So you, uh, you eat the way that we eat now. Um, um, we, uh, we, we have like a tremendous amount of variety now, my wife and I, because I've been sort of where you're at for like four or five years. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you would, you know, you might play it forward from what you're eating now for several years and, mm-hmm. you know, we eat everything from, you know, veggie burgers and, you know, I can handle ketchup, no problems. And we can have, uh, you know, other nights it's like, um, you know, there's mung dal recipe in our program and and uh i gotta think actually like it's we have a lot of lentils and rice and lentils yeah, yeah that's, lentils on and my, rice. that's on my salad too every day i have yeah. like a, i put a cup of lentils every on my salad too yeah, yeah i forgot F- to say that fabulous and melissa um uh, bu- uh cooks them in a big pot a really good quality big pot on the stove top slow cooks them with a whole bunch of different vegetables and seasoning mm-hmm. so it's a delicious sort of oh, yeah. uh, flavoring on top of the rice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, uh, gosh, I just. Oh, yeah, and yeah. sauerkraut. Sauerkraut. Okay, great. So you're eating okay. a lot of sauerkraut. I've been recently yeah. obsessed. So yeah. I didn't tell you, but my boyfriend, so he, uh, it's just me and him, we live here, but he uh, went paleo with me, okay, in the beginning, you yeah. know, to support me, and I was making the food, and then he went vegan with me. Fantastic. So, yeah. So we're both completely vegan and he's like obsessed with sauerkraut. Okay. And I guess I tried like a really nasty one a long time ago. So I was like, oh, but I found a good one. So I've been eating like four like scoops of that a day. And I even noticed that even makes me feel better. I'm like, I'll eat sauerkraut like for the rest of my life. Like there, you should just, everyone should incorporate that into their diet as well. Did you, do you buy it like the Bubby's brand from Whole Foods or do you make your own? We want to make our own right now. I do buy um, a raw, like organic one Local. from Sprouts. Yeah. Local mm-hmm. one. Even better. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, uh, until I'm further 
until I'm informed of the otherwise, I think that the Bubbies one at Whole Foods is good to go. I think that it's a it's a good quality product for what is a huge company that supplies to a huge, you know, grocery store. Normally, those sort of things aren't good. But in this case, I do think that that Bubby's brand is good if you don't have a local supply and you're based in the US and you have a Whole Foods nearby. Um, so I think- oh, Mil- just, on that, just on that, um, that's, I now I want to tell people like, don't waste your time on like probiotics. I, I feel like it's just such a waste. Like you could buy sauerkraut for $5 and you're going to get trillions, trillions of probiotics more than you would get an entire bottle of like probiotics. So they're just like things that you can do to reduce the cost of things. So basically in the morning I take a B12 and two turmeric supplements and sauerkraut and my juice. That's my medicine. Fantastic. Yep. And I, I, I think that's great that you brought that up. Um, I've mentioned that a few times, but it needs reiterating. You're absolutely right. There's an order of magnitude, more bacteria by eating a big cup of sauerkraut than taking yeah. the probiotics. Yeah. So, and and it's, uh, as you say, it's very affordable for everyone, even if they are on a strict yeah. budget. Yeah. Um, and the, the thing about the sauerkraut too is that the bacteria are more diverse because yes. they are a, you know, like the cultures that are created are, uh, are more diverse than the specific strains that are created for the probiotic by the companies. Um, yeah, there's no downside in that. It's, it's so, fantastic. I have one thing. So during this time of like, you know, changing my diet and this whole journey that I've been on, I saw, um, I was drinking a, like a herbal tea, from like a Chinese specialist and um, and it, he had used that to help with his RA and like he's from China and he came down here to like um, help, you know, Americans because he's like, you know, he was talking to like Americans and they're like on the medication sick and <laughs> I guess there's these Chinese herbs. And so I had been drinking that for six months too. Yeah. What's, well. what's it called? Um, actually have it right here. Great. Um, uh, it's rheumatoid arthritis herbal tea and, uh, I don't know the name of the, what we can do. You can look it up. You can look it up online. It's, um, it's in Pomona, California. Well, maybe you could find out for us because people probably won't do that. They, they could be on their treadmills or on a cycle bike or something. So what we'll do is. Uh, if you could just find the the actual ingredients for us, if at all possible. Email. Oh, I have the ingredients right Oh, yeah, here. go ahead with the ingredients. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Chinese Angelica. Mm-hmm. Safflower. Mm-hmm. Uh, cassia twig. Mm-hmm. Uh, medicinal Sciathula root. Okay. These are long. Um, there's a lot here. Common three wing nut root. Large leaf root, catasura, pepper stem, um, common flower quince fruit, um, ginseng. There's okay. like there's there's a few more, okay. but um, I've been drinking this because um, I found him online. Um, but he wouldn't let me drink the tea in the beginning when I got diagnosed because I was so low in iron and all that stuff. He said you have to get your iron up. You have to be in a healthy you know, state as far as like your iron and stuff when you take drink the tea. Mm. So the tea, this tea actually really significantly helped me with pain. So I believe like the tea played a part of it because it helped me manage the pain. Even though I had a uh, swelling, it helped manage the pain and enabled to, me to be able to eat without being, you know, on the medication. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, people are going to want to know what that is uh, more specifically. So maybe he has a website link that we could uh, we could use. And you can give me this to me offline and I can add it okay. to the show notes. Okay. Yes. I so, definitely want to because I'm yeah. like such a believer in it. Like it really helped me a lot. Awesome. If someone's trying to like manage their symptoms, you know, at least like if they if they have little enough symptoms, I mean, my my fingers are really swollen, but I was still able to function. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm in grad school, and it, it was difficult for me to type and stuff like that. But the pain 
definitely subsided significantly and the stiffness um, from the tea. But I know for sure the food is the biggest part because my inflammation didn't go down until I took out the dairy and the meat. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. All right. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share? I've got a couple, I've got a couple of open loops. Let me just ca- like cross them off first before we, before you ever think about anything else you'd like to share. First of all, one open loop was that we did mention nightshades before. Let me just make a comment on those to people who are still a little bit concerned about nightshades. Um, I work with now over 300 people in our community forum yeah. and we get a lot of feedback about various foods and, you know, we got to, that's a large enough sample size to start to get trends, you know, and mm-hmm. g- generally speaking, I, I don't see the nightshade group of vegetables as providing any more of a reintroduction challenge than any of the other vegetables statistically. Um, now I don't, uh, you know, so I therefore don't, for instance, um, put them nightshade vegetables later in the reintroduction sequence. I simply um, have them scattered in their likelihood to sort of create pain based on feedback from thousands of people who have done the process and have given me feedback and what they're able to eat. So it's very anecdotal, but it seems to work. So um, anyway, so the point being is that each food needs to be tested individually for the individual person. And it means Mm -hmm. that one day when your stomach is robust and your healing has made a lot of progress, then white potatoes uh, are a very, very good chance of being put back in your diet. I absolutely love white potatoes, eat them them. all the time. And you used to another part of my lunch or snack throughout the day. Right. Um, Yes. But we have to graduate to the point where we can eat those foods. So it doesn't yeah. mean run out and eat them now, but I, I want everyone to feel inspired by what you've done. Yeah. And from um, uh, other guests that we've had and what I've done, that there comes a time when you've healed enough where these foods can become not only tolerable, but delicious, mm-hmm. eaten regularly yeah. and health promoting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. And then the other one I had uh, in terms of an, uh, something to to um, add was we we have some great Instagrammers that are spreading the word about our program and plant based living and really creating a community. And yeah. um, you, yes, I follow uh, Ida. Yeah, Ida. 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 Yes. yes. Yeah. I, I've been following her, but I was following her when I was like paleo, so I right. felt so guilty. I'm like. <laughs> Mm, like hers looks so nice and I got an animal piece of meat here. But well, now you so guys. Now I actually messaged her because I was like, Hey, like you're an inspiration. Cause like, you know, I was paleo and now I turn, you know, vegan and like, I'm so much happier and healthier. And so she was like, yeah, like good job. Like, you know, keep in touch with me. You know, she's like doing great. So awesome. uh, that's she, she, yeah. she's doing outstanding and now she's uh, pregnant. And she's got a baby on the way, which is so exciting. So she's got a plant-based pregnancy and, uh, you know, she's talking about how thrilled she is because she's um, like yourself, like all of us have put a lot of discipline and a lot of hard work into our healing and the rewards are way, way beyond the, uh, the effort. Let me tell you this. So basically my Instagram has been a live experiment for my followers. By the way, my Instagram is called turning pain into purpose. If you, yeah, um, that's what, what, that's what I was heading towards a moment ago. Yep. But, um, so everyone's been following me and it's, you know, been a live journey. I literally post like my blood results, post pictures of my hand progress, you know, food, what I eat every day. And, um, it's interesting how like some people, you know, they still discredit, you know, they don't believe, you know, like, like I'm a lucky person and that's what I'm getting at. I'm not a lucky person. I wasn't unlucky that I got it and I'm not lucky that I overcame it because it was 100% hard work. Like it was not fun going places with people and watching people eat all this delicious stuff. Like, it, it hasn't been easy, but now it's like, I just, I love what I'm eating. I don't even care. I'm like, I see people sitting in the line at McDonald's and I'm just like, no, stop. 
Like it's disturbing. Yeah. I'm yeah. Like yeah, no, I've almost like, I've you know I've almost reached out at the checkout at supermarkets and taken food off of the conveyor belt for people. I've nearly actually removed it and looked at them and thought you should not be eating that. I've had to really hold back. It's very hard for me because I see suffering every day. I'm dealing with people who need help, making mistakes, needing corrections, right? And then I watch people who are naively heading in that same direction every day all around me. I'm like, if you only knew where you're going. Yes. And then like, you know, people are trying to make changes, you know, like that follow me, you know, they see, they, they're actually like message me all the time. Like I got a juicer, I'm doing this and that, but then I'll see some of them and they, they're drinking a Coke. And, you know, and some people have even messaged me like I've tried everything and I'm like, okay, really everything, Mm -hmm. everything. Like I basically, my boyfriend last year was like, I don't want you to work. I want you to 100% focus on healing 100%. So I was in grad school. I, you know, focused on my grad school and then everything else was like self care, something that I had never done my entire life. And now I'm all about self care. I'm like, it's not selfish. It's to survive. And it, it's like, I'm going to, I'm 29. I'm going to be 30 at the end of this year. Okay. So this is when you start for me, you know, cause I, I, I'm like, I like to think that I, you know, when I have kids later, I thought way later in life, cause it's like, Oh, I need to get my career and all this stuff. Now I'm like, there's like so much more in life that I like care about. Like it's not all school. It's not all my grades. Like it's about being a quality person. It's about helping people. It's about sharing your knowledge. Like I feel like when you go through something like this, it literally is your obligation to tell other people like stop stop, you know, and it's kind of a a fine line because sometimes I feel like, you know, I don't know if I'm coming off like, hey, you know, don't do that. But then also it's like, well, someone's got to tell you, like if someone would have told me a long time ago, like stop eating French fries, like I'm talking about like, you know, fast food dipped in this like grease that's probably GMO, you know, like God, like now I'm thinking like, I ate so much GMO food, like it's absolutely disturbing. Like In N Out, people don't know this, you have to go look it up, but In N Out's all about like, oh, we cook our fries in vegetable oil. So I'm thinking all this time, like, oh, I'm eating a healthier fast food. No, their fries are like deep fried in cottonseed oil, which is 100% genetically modified, okay? And their beef, comes from factory farms, which is full of hormones and antibiotics and all this terrible stuff. You know, it's like, I mean, you don't know this until you research, research, research. Yeah. I'm going to go to a place. I look at the source of it. I, I get all crazy with it because I'm yeah. like, I don't want that in my body. But the safest thing to do, and I completely agree with you, the safest thing to do is just eat all your foods at home and prepare them all, make them low fat, plant-based. And that is like the safest way to go. So um, if people are, you know, just really want to keep it simple, it's just follow this program, do this, and you don't have to try and reinvent the wheel or think about all of these complexities. It takes time to be able to eat out. And for the longest time, that was our biggest challenge. My wife and I, we, you know, we used to travel with rice cookers. We learned how to actually use rice cookers at hotels without setting off the fire alarms. I mean, we had to, yeah. I was taking rice cookers on cruise ships because I used mm-hmm. to work on cruise ships. And the sacrifices that we have to make are, are, are most evident when we're trying to eat out because you can't trust the foods. The foods no. are atrocious. And There's hidden the waiters, problems. The waiters are like, or whoever, the employees, no. Nobody knows any information on nutrition. Like you ask somebody like, what's in this? They're like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, well, can you please go ask? Like, I feel like it's an inconvenience, you know, and people are annoyed by that. And it's like, well, hello, like, you know, this is important. This is important to me, you know? So it's like you end up getting the salad or like something super basic because you don't want Absolutely. anything. That- yeah. 
Yeah. So say for like, I have to go to functions and it's funny you bring up uh, genetically modified. Um, you know, I worked at an event two nights ago in Melbourne interstate at the second biggest city in Australia. And I sat next to the ex CEO of Monsanto, Australia. Wow. <laughs> now at this function, it was not where I gave my keynote presentation. I did not speak about <laughs> my health and that. Um, oh, I, I was, I was a, uh, you know, I have another job where I entertain and then host events and stuff. Yeah. So that's, that's what I did. But, uh, I let him do all the talking and, uh, he said that as uh, in that role, he used to at times have bodyguards at events and, uh, the public perception was just so, so strong. Um, you know, it, a diff difficult role and he's moved on from that since, but it was interesting to come close to, uh, to, to someone from that company because we, well, you know, we have certain prejudices. So this yeah, has been research. This has they been a, a, a fabulous, fabulous chat, Erica. And I think we can um, we can do this again. And and I'd like to um, call upon you down the track. I've got some sort of potentially some uh, online events planned where I want to sort of get a big audience together and and get some speakers. And I'd like to uh, um, potentially have you involved with that. Uh, and I want to thank you for being such an inspiration to so many people on Instagram. Now you've got some great company. We mentioned Eda before. I also want to mention for people who, who do enjoy Instagram as a platform. So they need to follow Eda and I'll put her anchor uh, in the show notes of this podcast on our, on pattersonprogram.com forward slash blog. Also Christine, who continues to create some fabulous recipes for children. So her son, Cole, um, I believe one of the um, first in the world oh, who I've has. Oh, I've seen that video. Yeah. I watched testimony. Yeah. yeah. So Cole, Cole is like a um, a pioneer for children around the world who have JIA, and Christine and her family um, are uh, leading the leading the world. I believe in that. Uh, follow Christine and her son Cole, and of course Roxana, a uh, another uh, fabulous uh, plant based champion who was also a previous guest. I her too. Yeah, I've seen. Yeah. I, I like for the last like month I've been taking like Epsom salt baths and I've watched every one of your testimonials and it just like amps me up like yeah. even more. I'm like, yes, like I'm not lucky. Like I had this crazy thing and I, you can overcome it. Like it's crazy. Um, but I do, I would love to do that. I would love to speak for you. That would be awesome because what's crazy is when I first got diagnosed, because I'm so obsessed with like Ted talks and stuff like that. I was like, I really like would love to do a Ted talk. Like I would love to do a Ted talk about like giving patients the option to try an extreme diet or a plant-based diet. Right. And then, or the medication, I feel like there should be, there has to be some talk. They're just, this is negligent. You cannot let someone walk out the door and just think that they have absolutely no freaking control over their lives. Oh, so it's interesting really quickly. My rheumatologist, uh, when I saw her last, her husband, um, studies like plant-based diet and heart disease. He's a doctor as well. Good. So I told her, you study that. And I said, I asked her something. I said, can you do me a favor? And she said, what? Cause her whole attitude changed when she first saw me to this, she actually made a video with me for my Instagram followers to say that I overcame a disease with a plant-based vegan diet. I want that and video. And it's on my Instagram. It's on oh, my great. Instagram for oh, everyone to see. So awesome. everyone can see the proof. Um, but yeah, it's just like. And the husband, her husband. Oh yes. Yeah. So the plant-based diet. So I asked her, here's, here's a little thing. Why don't you just ask your patients what type of diet that they eat? Just to like gather the information in your head. You don't have to conduct a research, but just so you have, can see a pattern and a consistency. Uh, and then she's like, you know what? You know, some of my um, patients, they, you know, they tell me that when they eat dairy, like their symptoms are worse. So I'm like, okay. Oh, and then I was like, you know what? I'm like, here's the thing. Nobody knows if you look at the Arthritis Foundation online, nothing like that. They don't know why anyone gets autoimmune diseases or rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, they don't know. And then you're treating someone based off of these blood markers, 
that could be different for each person. You could have it positive, you could have it negative, but you still have the same symptoms. So how are we treating something when we don't know the underlying cause? That was my thing. I'm like, okay, you don't know why I got this. You can't give me one explanation. Not one. There's not one explanation. So how can you treat that? And I'm like, I told her, I'm like, the closest thing we have to figuring anything out is leaky gut. That's the closest thing. And it makes total sense because of how much of our, you know, our immune system is like around our gut and everything. So she was like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to start asking my clients. Awesome. What their well done. This is a good so, start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I can see you, uh, you've got so much passion and, uh, you're so excited about, you know, when we learn something, when we learn the real truth, the truth gives us goosebumps. You know, when we know yep. that something is so true that it's divine, then we feel elated and we feel inspired. We feel light and, and we feel not just feel light, but we can, we sense the light in us and that that's what we're meant to be doing and that that's what we should be sharing because everything else other than the truth and a way of helping people is, is less important. Yes. There's um, one more thing I wanted to share. Um, my good friend is, um, he's going to school to be a doctor um, at Midwestern University in Arizona. And so he's so, cause he's like, you know, almost finished with his schooling. And, uh, I think they have an integrative medicine program and he last year was the president of that club. There's a new president. So he's in shock by this cause he knows all about the numbers, all about this stuff. And he's like, you are like a miracle. Like he's like, this does not happen. So he talked to one of his professors who is a doctor who wants to see all my lab work and send all that to stuff because they're really interested. They want to do like a case thing on it. Cool. And then actually the, the new president of the school just called me today because he told them my story. So they want me to come speak to their students, their integrative medicine students, on how they should talk to patients about plant-based diet to treat symptoms. I'm like, Absolutely awesome. what is going on? I'm talking to Clint Patterson. I'm doing that. Like, what? Like, it's crazy. I never, no, no, I never thought any of this. It is absolutely wonderful. I just got goosebumps again. I can see yeah. you on stage. I can picture you doing that. <laughs> you know, so let me ask you this. How are those levels of depression and anxiety these days? Remember that used to be your whole yeah. thing? Let me tell you okay i'm sorry i'm getting crazy about this one because i just watched a ted talk on a psychologist or a psychiatrist who treated her patients with a plant-based diet high in nutrients and virtually all of her patients depression and anxiety went away from a plant-based diet okay so within like Four months of me changing my diet, even when I was paleo, right, from cutting all the crap out, eating more veggies, juicing every day, I noticed my mood improved, okay? And so I'm like, this is weird. Like, why do I feel better when I have, like, a disease? You know, I should be <laughs> moping around. I should be, like, depressed about my life. Like, be, you know, scared as hell. And it got better. And it got better. And, like, I feel like the happiest person on this planet. Like I try to get depressed because I'm like, I was so used to it. I'm like, okay, get like, you should be <laughs> like, wait, I can't. I'm like literally so freaking happy. Like I'm happy. And like my friend, my friends are like the one um, that's like going to school for medicine and his brother, my really good friends. And they're like, you are just like filled with joy. And like, it's literally like coming out of you and you cannot contain it. Like, they're like, it is so like contagious. And that's how I feel. I'm like, if anything, if you people want to get rid of their depression, anxiety, it's all food related. 100%. Like in my mind, because I live with that my entire life. Okay. Entire life. And... I don't have any of that. Not one day do I get anxiety. And it's not because I have control over my symptoms. 
it's just I feel better. I'm so connected to my food. Like when I juice, I like I'm basically talking to my food when I'm making my food. I'm like in my head, I'm like, okay, this has vitamin C. This has, you know, calcium and this is good for me and this is organic. And like it's just like this whole energy thing. And it's like when you when you put fruits and like vegetables and stuff like that that has good energy, you put that energy inside you and then you're able to give that energy out into the world. And that's like the cycle of it. So it goes beyond just, you know, eating a healthy diet. I mean, it's going to change your whole world. Mm -hmm. It certainly does. That's very David Wolf of you. You know, David Wolf, the raw food man. That's that's exactly how he talks. I interviewed him at his house in a way. My boyfriend and I are a bit obsessed with him. He does the breathing exercises like four times a week with the cold showers. Yeah, yeah, okay. He's a, he's a cool dude. Yes, he, yeah. he is. And I'm all about that alkalizing the body. And that's what I feel like Bikram does. Like in yeah. Bikram, oh, and I didn't really touch much on that. But yes, Bikram um, like bumped it up like 5,000 times. I go five times a week. Yeah. My instructors, I, I finally told them, like, you know, I have RA. And they're like, what? I wouldn't even guess. I'm like, no. Yeah, yeah. No. Like, well, not anymore. Yeah. And I told them about this, and they're going to start telling, you know, because a lot of people go there with these conditions. Absolutely. So I'm like, I'm trying to get the word around my Bikram Yoga place and talk to people because – a lot of people that go there have a lot of different conditions that they're trying to manage. And Bikram is just absolutely the most amazing thing in my life. Like you just detoxify, Mm -hmm. you just detoxify. And it feels so good to let all that out. Yeah. So the reason that I feel so, so confident about, uh, you know, the future, because I stopped using the word cure like six, seven years ago, Um, Mm -hmm. and it's about having complete control over your future, your symptoms and so forth. And when you've got that yin and yang of low fat plant based and Bikram, Mm -hmm. you you have this, you have this almost uh, impenetrable fortress against future symptoms and other diseases. That combination of Bikram and low fat plant based, I mean, I would like to see statistics of people who do that and getting disease in the future. Like I would say it'd be, I mean, it it is so powerful, that combination. It's unbelievable. Not even just about the RA. I mean, it's preventative for so many things, you know, like uh, just like heart disease and all these different things that people have. It's like, how can you get this if you literally live this lifestyle, eating plant-based and detoxifying your body on that level like five times a week like how is that even yeah good how would anything bad grow in you like how you're yeah. not giving it the right environment it's got no it's chance not- it has no. no chance no chance and we need to keep saying these things and 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 keep reinforcing these things because i've had listeners that come back to me and say look i've been listening to the podcast for a year or following your emails for like a couple of years or something and i only just started bikram the other week because you keep talking about it sometimes it just takes that long and the tail is so long before someone actually takes action so that's another thing to for us to continue to continue to reinforce. Now you've you've uh, been one of our longest guests we've ever had. I haven't stopped smiling this entire conversation. <laughs> I know. It's, <laughs> it's been news. it's been uh, really really great. Your energy is obvious. Your desire to convey information is clear. Um, your results are outstanding, and I am um, really excited to uh, to to do some more stuff with you down the track. Yes. Um, um, you know, it just as someone who's more of a veteran at this, talking to a uh, to, to someone who's uh, uh, you know bug eyed and 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 having lots of fun discovering these things, sort of right now, um, you know, always keep in mind that uh, if, if things start to feel a little uncomfortable, you just need to quickly reset back to some real basic foods again. Mm-hmm. Normally, it only take a day or two days, and then you can put back into your diet all the things that you're enjoying on a daily basis. But if you feel symptoms, Take action immediately, intervene, and then everything gets back on track real fast. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. Yeah. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Um, I use, like, 
a tiny bit of like oil sometimes, you know, like olive oil or something like that. Like very, very, I mean, it's very little amount. Everything I try to do without. I don't notice, notice anything, but I minimize it, you know, as much as possible. Yeah. So if you're using that, you're taking a it risk. Froze. It's just, you're just taking a risk because the, and I can send you the studies. So like hummus, like I'll get hummus, like from, um, the farmer's market and, you know, there's a little bit of oil and like hummus and then, um, basically, I mean, it's not much, but there is tiny bits. There's a of little, this. yeah. So it, all it is, is basically, uh, a higher risk than the other foods. So we know that high fat foods are inflammatory for the gut and with gut inflammation comes the joint inflammation. So it's not, you cannot eat those foods. It's that mm -hmm. just be aware that they are riskier. Okay. That's okay. all it is. It's just a little riskier. Yeah. And if you find that you're starting to feel a little bit of warmth or a little bit of puffiness in the fingers again, then all you have to do is just avoid those yeah. foods for a few days. And it's, yeah. that's because, and I'm giving you this information based on where you're at right now. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's why. Yeah. And then, um, what was the other one? Oil. Oh, and then bread. Okay. So I've been, um, incorporating because, you know, I was paleo for so long. And then now that I changed my diet to vegan, I'm like, okay, well, was it really gluten all this time or was it really the meat? So like, um, there's like organic bread shop by my, by my house and they make organic like sourdough bread and stuff. So I'll eat that and I don't notice anything. And then, um, like I've been eating like not a lot. I still try to limit this as much as possible. Cause I don't want to go back to relying on bread. I just, it reminds me of old habits. So I just try to keep it as minimal as possible, but I'll, um, have like whole wheat pita. It's all whole wheat. Like it has to be organic, like whole wheat with not all this like weird ingredients in it. Um, I definitely will never, ever have like, you know, white flour or anything like that. So what do you think about like the gluten thing? And Yeah. So, so the situation with re wheat and so I'm glad that I've, I'm actually halfway through reading a book called Eat Wheat. Okay. So it's a book that's just been released and it debunks all of the ridiculousness of things like grain brain and, and wheat belly. Yeah. Um, so um, and the, the author of that book is going to be on the podcast soon. He's just waiting on me to finish the book and then I can have him on the podcast. So, um, in a nutshell, breads are as diverse as you could ever imagine. So a processed white bread is an atrocity to humankind. Oh, yeah. I mean, so what, what the problem there really is the instant spike in glucose. So you just get, it's just absorbs like fairy floss yeah. or that I think you call it in the state, something different that candy oh, cane. I used to get, when I used to eat that, yeah. the white bagels yeah. be, before I changed my diet, I yeah. would get like so lethargic after, like, I'm telling you, like I would get so lethargic that I couldn't even talk. Like that's how a mess <laughs> my brain chemistry. I'd be like, like at work, like what? Like literally like cross-eyed, like, and I'm like, Oh, now I need like a Starbucks coffee to like pick me up. And then it's just like these constant, yeah. like disaster. Now, I don't deal yeah. with that, but no unrefined like flowers or anything like that. So, so yeah. So, at, but at the other end of the spectrum, um, the author of uh, eat wheat goes to explain that we have actually been eating wheat far longer than records show that we've been consuming meats. I mean, the, the genetic history that we have associated with cereal grains is enormous. So humans know how to eat these grains. It's the crappy version of these grains. It's the other processed foods. It's all the other junk in our diet that has led us to then have a compromised digestive system so that a large chain protein like gluten then becomes hard to break down. It is not that gluten is a problem today. It is not that gluten was a problem in the past. It's that human digestive systems have become pathetic and useless at breaking down what was previously something that was easy for us to break down, which is gluten. So mm -hmm. hence the rise in gluten sensitivity, which could be just said in a different way, pathetic digestive system, um, mm -hmm. where gluten is, because it's the more difficult protein, the first protein to say, hey, I'm causing you troubles because you don't have the 
digestive strength to 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 uh, defragment me. And so this means that um, with time, and I experienced this myself, I had a gluten sensitivity. I wasn't able to eat that without getting a blocked nose. I couldn't breathe through my nose as soon as I would eat that. Same with ice creams, all these different things before I got diagnosed. But now um, a whole wheat um, uh, bread, especially <laughs> your sourdough bread that you're getting next door, if you ask them, Ask them how long it takes to make the bread because if it ferments for a couple of days, you can enjoy that as much it as does. you want. It's, yeah. They, okay. yeah. I asked them that too because I heard, like, you know, the, obviously the longer the better. The longer but the yeah, better. But yeah, that's what I, I was reading into bread and it was like, it's not bread. It's like the production of bread now. You know, they shorten the process yes. so much for mass production. Yes. So it's like, so people, you know, have messaged me now because they're like, oh, I see you're like eating bread. Like it's it's like it's like heroin to people, you know, it's like, oh, cool. what are you doing oh to yourself? I'm like, I'm like, no, like you have to like listen to your body, you know, like fit, like do you feel like it's triggering you? Because you could like wheat has nutrition to it. Like there, it's A not lot. unnutritious. And we've looked at it as like the most like unnutritious thing for you, like you could possibly eat. And it's like, no, it has nutritional value, but you got to be eating other things good along with it. I mean, you just eat wheat and wheat and wheat and wheat and wheat, and you don't have all these other cushions, you know, nutrients, then yeah, it's going to be a problem. But I feel like I'm at a good place because I do eat so much good stuff all the time that I don't think my body at this point is, going, hey, 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 like, don't be doing that. And it shouldn't. And again, it's the right format of bread. It's the right type of bread. Um, it's like if you go to buy a car, you can get a totally crap car that's going to fall apart. In, fa in fact, the car metaphor is not even as good as the bread one because most cars are going to get you from A to B. A crappy piece of bread is like going to cause you dramatic health problems and a quality piece of bread once you're able to not react to it in an inflammatory way, is going to support and nurture the microbiome and your gut and your health. There are so many yeah. health benefits for eating wheat. It can support and help stimulate the growth of your microbiome. It's food for your microbiome. It's healthy. And there is this whole concept of anti-nutrients and lectins that get mm -hmm. put out to confuse the public. This is all crap. The truth is... I feel like it's just another thing right. to, like, it's sell products that are gluten-free. Like, it's just... Exactly. It's all marketing. We it's shouldn't... All marketing. The, the gut is our second brain, right? The gut is our second brain. And this brain is never smarter than the gut brain. The gut yeah. brain, that's the one that needs to be able... That's the one that we need to listen to and to nurture. This thing gets in the way. This thing reads too many stupid blog posts from fools trying to sell something online to try and make money, but ultimately disserve the public. What we need to do is to heal our gut with the quality plants and we will thrive. Well, now that I'm like, you know, I'm kind of glad I had the whole paleo experience because I'm so repulsed by it now that I just like never, ever, ever, never ever like I'm so like disgusted by me and everything I'm just like oh I can't believe like I ate that like you know and but it, it, it was an experience where now it's like I know I know better I know and like people have been messaging me like well how come you eat grains now and stuff like that I'm like well you know my body can tolerate it and you know I'm not eating meat anymore and I'm like honestly not even if you have a disease no one should be eating meat like the production is just absolutely atrocious like it's just so repulsive mm. and it's like people had that information you know it's like I now I look at it when people are like oh I'm cooking a steak I'm like that's not a steak that was a cow like that's how I see it now you know but mm. everyone like I was you're just so detached from food you're like yeah pork chop or a chicken wing. It's like, no, that was part of something. I know. You know? I know. And I grew up on a energy is in you now. And like, that's not a good breeding ground for like, or it is a good breeding ground for disease, but it's not a good breeding ground for like health and happiness. Definitely not. Mm -hmm. I grew up on a farm and my sister and I, as children, before we had developed any kind of prejudices, 
between the way we should eat and the way we shouldn't. And I think it's good to look at things through a child's eyes. And we found the process of killing a bullock, as it was called, as we would, you know, uh, kill one of our steers so that we could eat it for the family. As the actually it wasn't the most disgusting thing on the farm. The most disgusting thing was preparing pigs because you actually have to put a dead pig after its neck is cut and, and its head is shot with a bullet into a big tub of boiling water so that its hair through the boiling water peels off its skin. Okay, so this is how it's done. Now, that was the grossest thing and the grossest thing I will ever smell. But what we used to be so repulsed by was when the bullock was killed, we used to have to actually help remove its guts and intestines and stuff whilst it's hanging upside down and the blood's running down. And like, if ever there was an indication that little kids are not designed or not configured to be carnivores, it's watching myself and my sister trying not to be not to be sick while we're trying to help yeah. dad cut the skin off this animal. I mean... I it, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So... So uh, uh, Gary Yurofsky, who's a great, you know, he's more on the animal rights kind of things. He said, I will shut up and never speak again about animal rights or anything to do with veganism. The day that you put a rabbit and an apple in with a child who's one year old, and if the child eats the rabbit first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? It's just, it's just such common sense as to... Uh, as to the way that we're kind of naturally inclined. None of us want to see an animal that's ripped apart and no one's thinking there's something on the side of the road that I need to stop my car, go back and start gnawing into. It just doesn't work that way. But anyway, we are digressing a lot and um, yeah. I, I, we really have overshot, but I've really enjoyed this chat and I hope that Thank listeners have, have, have got a lot out of this. So thanks so much, Erica. And if you'd like to follow Erica, on Instagram, go to turning pain into purpose on Instagram. So thank you so much, Erica. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah.